So welcome to Authenticate Lunch and Learn Biometrics Roundtable. I am Dr. Ray Rivera, and I'm honored to be able to present this um, roundtable with uh, Dr. Stephanie Shukers. So the agenda is going to look something like this. We'll go through the biometric component certification process a little more in depth than uh, what you've previously seen on other sessions. And then Stephanie will take us through the biometric component program performance evaluation. So we'll get into the nitty gritty performance evaluation that is expected for the biometric component certification. So the process is a little like this. To start the biometric component certification program is um, a program that certifies biometric components and or its subsystems and is completely independent of the authenticator certification program. We do have what we call accredited labs, and these are our biometric accredited labs. They have to go through a rigorous testing process in order to be able to evaluate um, products under the FIDO biometric component certification program. So what does the process look like? We first start with an application stage, then we go through qualification, the actual biometric testing, there'll be an executed laboratory report, then the vendor will cert do a certification request, and then the FIDO Alliance will issue that certificate. Getting into the depths of each of these, we start with the application. So the vendor will go to our website, and there's a link for them to apply for the biometric component certification. They will also start to work with the, um, the aforementioned accredited labs, to negotiate a contract perspective on what that would look like for the, um, the actual evaluation of the product. This biometric secretariat will review each of the application and approves it, rejects it, or asks for additional clarifications. Once it's approved, then we're able to go to the next step, the actual qualification. The Vital Alliance introduced this uh, qualification step. It's an interim stage to the actual certification program, and it doesn't confirm the self-attestation biometric performance numbers in any way whatsoever. The lab is supposed to provide the target of evaluation, which is the test harness, an allowed integration document, all the test plans that are to be performed, and then any other details deemed necessary. Once all that information is gathered, then the next steps are to actually go through the qualification. So the laboratory, the vendor developer, and FIDO will all agree on a certification schedule. They will develop a contract for finishing the certification, and then they'll develop a plan with respect to all the performance tests. In coordination with the biometric secretariat, there will be an assurance to agree that the target evaluation envisions all the positive perspectives to successfully complete the certification process. Upon this agreement, then qualification has been met. But it's a big note that at this point in time, there hasn't been any actual evaluation conducted to validate whether the conformance tests are met. Um, so that's just, we've just qualified this product to go through the certification program. So then we get into the biometric testing. So the qualification has been approved by the biometric secretariat, the vendor, and the lab, and now the testing needs to be conducted. So the lab will submit a test plan for approval to the biometric secretariat, and then the um, then it will be submitted to the accredited lab. This is our biometric accredited lab. They'll execute on the test according to the biometric requirements in the plan detailed, that's been detailed out. And then the testing will be a combination of online and offline live subject testing. And Stephanie will go through the specifics of that evaluation in the next section. One of the required documents for submitting to the biometric component certification is what we call a loud integration document. It is developed by the vendor and it's submitted to the lab for testing. It also becomes an output from the testing for support of this component into an authenticator. It's used to document changes necessary to accommodate integration into an authenticator. 
have to document any hardware or software changes that are acceptable in order to maintain the performance evaluation from the component testing. And it has to be um, the accredited biometric testing laboratory must validate and submit um, that is consistent with the test harness. This is part of the actual program input and output that is required. Once all the testing has been completed, then the accredited lab will submit what we call a laboratory report. This actually goes to the biometric secretariat for review. The report has to include um, the review of the allowed integration document that validates any changes that will so that they don't impact performance and an overview of the testing results. Once that review is completed, then the secretariat will render either a decision to approve it, reject it, or ask for additional clarification. Once the vendor, the laboratory report is approved, then the vendor can go to the next step, and that's to request the certificate and have it issued. So once the approval is met, the vendor submits for a request um, for the certificate, and a biometric component certificate is issued. Additional steps include, um, like a certificate number will be uh, referenced um, once, it, it, once that biometric component is integrated into an authenticator through the authenticator certification program, which is independent of this program. And the vendor also has an option to ex ex execute on our um, trademark licensing agreement in order to use the FIDO biometric certified logos. So we have an entire suite of logos that are available for vendors um, once they get their certificate. And the last step is just a discussion of changes after the initial certification. So there's the allowed integration document and it provides a, uh, what, how this authenticator can be, or how this biometric component can be integrated into an authenticator. Provides changes to hardware, software, and um, other modifications, you know, from a physical perspective. So what we've had to do within this program is identify, so here's the allowed integration document, here's how this biometric can be integrated into the authenticator, and then it's integrated. So what happens if something changes, like from a hardware change to a software change, or any other changes that could possibly affect the performance of the biometric component? So we've categorized them as minor changes or major changes. Depending on whether it's identified as a minor change, then you would have to issue a Delta certificate. If it's a major change, then we would have to issue a new certification on that product. So this is just something to be aware of when you're going through the biometric component certification process, that if modifications, when it's integrated, are either minor or major, that you might have to go through additional evaluation processes. And that's the process for getting certified. I will hand it over to Dr. Shukers, and she will take you through the evaluation specifics. Great. Thank you very much. So now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how the evaluation's done and the things we're measuring as part of the evaluation. Um, as Ray mentioned, we do do live subject testing. And as part of that testing, what we measure is the false accept rate or the probability two different people match that, sh that shouldn't. Um, this is related to then, of course, the security of the system. And we measure the false reject rate, the probability that um, the right person is rejected. Um, this is a convenience measure, typically. And then a measure, we do a bunch of testing, which I'll get into the details of, related to the presentation attack detection module. This is the module that rejects attacks um, made by fake biometrics, say like a fake fingerprint or face. Um, all this testing is in conformance with two ISO documents, 19795 and 30107, which are related to biometric testing. The actual performance um, requirements um, is that it should be less than one in 10,000 for the false accept rate, um, three in 100 for the false reject rate, and we'll talk a little bit more about this metric because it's a slightly more complicated um, on how we make those measurements. 
We also have a self-attestation option for vendors um, to declare false accept rates at lower than one in 10,000. Um, and what the testing lab must do is ensure that any of the testing results are consistent with these lower um, numbers. Uh, we can't do statistical tests like we do with the one in 10,000 for the number of subjects that we have, but we can um, uh, look at its consistency with the results that we have. As I mentioned, there are live subjects being part of this testing. Um, the 245 test subjects are used. Um, and if uh, it's fingerprint or um, a case where it might be one eye, uh, you can reduce that by half by using two different fingers as part of the testing, uh, but you can't further reduce it uh, beyond that. It's both a combination of online testing and offline testing. So the online is measuring the false reject rate. The offline is measuring the false accept rate. What we do offline is we do all combinations of the 200 45 subjects with each other. Uh, so we can get many, many combinations in order to reach the statistical relevance for one in 10,000. We do five attempts for each. Um, um, the subject does multiple attempts and then, as, and then we repeat for five transactions and multiple attempts if needed, I guess you, you would say. And then the statistical analysis is based on bootstrapping. So, Talking more about presentation attack detection. So this is measuring spoof attacks. Uh, we measure it based on something called the imposter attack presentation match rate. This match rate is actually measured for each spoof type separately. Those spoof types are called um, presentation attack species. And we've got presentation attack instruments, which are the specific spoofs that are created. We make many, many, many spoofs, which I'll get into the numbers in a minute, um, per um, attack um, type, and we do multiple attack types. Um, and I'll also show you some examples of that. Um, and then we do multiple, um, uh, we create multiple spoofs or presentation attack instruments for each type or species. We've triaged the attacks that are known out there into three levels. Level A attacks would be something anyone could perform, a layman, and don't take much time at all. Um, level B attacks, you need to be somewhat proficient and practice. And then level C are very sophisticated types of attacks. All our testing right now is focused on level A and level B. And uh, one thing to note, uh, access to the biometric characteristics in, tor in, in order to create the spoof attack is part of our triaging. So for example, it's pretty easy to get a photograph of somebody, but might be a little bit harder to get a video of them sp speaking a specific phrase. Um, and so that, you know, those types of access fall into different levels. And here's just a notional example of how these things fit together. You can see most of level A is based on things like paper or video display or, or not even video display, um, uh, still display on a phone um, and um, just kind of simple things you could see someone doing. And then you know, the middle attacks are related to things like the gelatin fingers, Maybe the video is a little bit more sophisticated, it's blinking, it's moving around, um, and other attacks like that. And then level C attacks, as I said, are out of scope, but this might be something like using 3D printers, uh, creating very sophisticated theatrical masks, um, a, a, creating a contact lens with someone's specific iris pattern, things that require very specialized equipment and knowledge. So um, this program has been in place for several years. We are soon to be releasing um, a 2.0 version. Um, this 2.0 version is focused on particularly the, the pad testing. Um, in our 1.0 version, we deliberately made the testing weak because at that time, these uh, systems were just arriving onto the marketplace. ISO standards weren't even in place. And um, we really wanted to 
get the idea of pad testing um, out and uh, get vendors comfortable with it such that we could then increase the requirements, which is what we're now doing as part of 2.0. The whole program is aligned with as many groups as, as we can um, that have interest in this and um, have requirements or other standards around uh, biometric testing, as I already mentioned, ISO, of course, but also common criteria, which I referenced earlier. And then um, folks like Google and Microsoft have requirements as, e as well as EMBCO and global platforms. So what do we change? In 2.0, in 2.0 or 1.0, our error rate was 20%. So basically um, the system had to reject 80% of the spoofs. Um, we recently now moved this down, and I don't think it's quite published yet, but it will be soon, um, to 7%. Um, so you can see that's quite a bit more challenging uh, um, in terms of having a system that rejects 93% of spoofs. And remember, this is for each spoof type that's tested must meet this requirement. We test now 10 spoof types um, in prior versions we were testing, sorry, we test now 12. In prior versions, we were testing 10. We've increased the number of subjects that our spoofs are, our PAIs are based on up to 25 from 10 before. And then the number of transactions for each spoof is uh, 250 for us, uh, sorry, for all spoof types is 250. There are a few other changes that we made in 2.0. Uh, we've aligned it with a new ISO vocabulary that's been published. We changed the false reject rate requirement from 3% and made it actually slightly higher at 5%. But part of this is due to the definition changes, uh, which I can address in the Q&A, as well as the fact now that we're adding more stricter requirements around uh, presentation attack detection. We've added some age and gender guidance for the subjects that our pad testing are based on and three of the spoof types um, that are created need to be designed with the, the particular target in mind. Um, so say for example, it's a specific technology of a fingerprint sensor, we would choose spoof, ask that the labs choose spoof types that might be more um, able to, or more difficult for that type of technology. We also have some minor changes. Um, I think I'm not gonna go into all of these, just leaving them here for greater deep, for you to review. But um, the biggest thing is we looked again at the, those levels that I was describing of all the different details and added a little really more clarity around them. And I think the most significant change that we made was related to voice recognition where a synthesis um, is also part of level B because there are some voice synthesis software that are readily available um, out um, in, um, on the internet. I had mentioned that we um, you sought to achieve alignment with other groups. We believe our requirements are very similar to the requirements of these other groups, um, such that if you've got FIDO certification, you would meet the requirements for other entities, as well as um, um, seeking to, you know, as much as possible, make the testing protocols very similar. We've also submitted some of the, the testing protocols back to ISO, such that there is a FIDO specific annex um, or appendix um, that's already published as part of 19795 part nine and then uh, pending for part four of 30107. Now 2.0 is coming. This is just some example dates. You know, clearly it's not quite out, so it's not gonna be published July 1, 2020. But whatever date it's published, 1.0 will still be available six months after that date. So say it becomes published December 1, then the sunset date would be um, uh, June 1, 2021. And what that means is you can be certified either on 1.0 or 2.0 during that overlap period. And here's just some references um, that you can look at. And that is the end of my comments. I'll look forward to your questions.